My name is Elizabeth and I am a former racist extremist. 25 years ago I left the Heritage Front, which was Canada's largest white supremacist organization at the time. I've spent most of the last quarter of a century educating people about the dangers of hate groups and sharing my story about how I regained my humanity. I often get feedback that people are moved or inspired by what I have to say. And if I shared my narrative with you today, perhaps you'd be touched too. Perhaps you'd even feel a little bit better about this messed up world we're in for a minute. But unfortunately, I can't give you that feel good change agent narrative today. You see, there are lots of people out there, journalists, activists, writers and academics who wish that formers like me would just go away. They criticize us and say we're given unfair status and perks while people who have fought racism their whole lives are ignored. They say we should just get out of the way so that people who need anti-racism, the people whose lives depend on it, can get on with the work they need to do without distraction. And you know what? They're right. In the past couple of years, I've witnessed formers rush around and break a whole lot of things. Now, I need to take a step back here and say that there are formers who are engaged in tremendously good work in both academia and the nonprofit sector. So I certainly don't mean to disparage all of us, but the damage that some formers are causing needs to be addressed. When it comes to activism, formers can end up walking a very tight line. On the one hand, many of us end up connecting with organizations that are created by and for people who are affected by hate. And on the other hand, particularly if we're engaged in de-radicalization work, we're exposed to the people and organizations that promote that intolerance. That's a very, very delicate push-pull. And on top of that, if we're doing it right, we're engaged in a lifelong process of unlearning our own prejudices and fixing our broken worldviews, not to mention healing the trauma that led us to be vulnerable to hate group recruitment in the first place. It's a lot. I mean, it is really a lot. And it can be really hard to keep going. Some formers navigate all of this by focusing on peace building. Now, peace building, which can encompass you know, community building, forming relationships, building bridges, it's very important and valuable work. And I'm sure this is unfathomable to most of you, but when you leave a hate group, understanding that we possess a shared humanity and a fundamental equality, it's a revelation. And finally, reaching out and connecting with other people and learning and growing, it feels so good. In fact, it's almost a relief. And really, it's no surprise that formers would want to stay in this part of their activism because the potential for doing good is so great. I'm sure you're saying, but there's a but in there somewhere. And yes, there is. And the but is that peace building and staying in that place can unfortunately lead to a lot of sidestepping. That sidestepping can include our personal work that we need to do, as well as, I guess, what I would call a political moral compass. This phenomenon can express itself in many ways, including lack of empathy for others, new formers being brought out into public conversations they're ill-equipped to handle, people not doing the work they need to do to confront all their prejudices, like transphobia, for example. And also, when this is really quite troubling, not confronting the misguided notion that anti-fascists are part of the problem. All of this can cause real and lasting harm to the communities that were supposed to be there to help. And all of this is happening in the name of anti-hate. It should come as no surprise, really. Hate groups recruit broken people, break them further, and then leave them without any social structure, healthy belief system, or connection to who they are as a person or their world. I'm so glad that there are de-radicalization programs out there today to help people navigate this process. But even so, it doesn't matter. You could have the best mentor, the best therapist, 
but there are still demons that you have to fight on your own. And it is up to all of us as formers to win those fights and make sure that we deserve that former label that we've been given. I wish that leaving a hate group was all that needed to happen to prove that you're a good person. But really figuring out that hate is wrong is kind of the lowest bar of entry into being a decent human being. There's no guarantee that anybody is going to do the work they need to do. And even the passage of time doesn't necessarily mean that someone has progressed in their journey. I can say that after 25 years of being away from hate, after learning about love and experiencing hate as a victim instead of a perpetrator, I'm still as broken as the rest. And I have no more right to be here on this virtual version of the iconic TED Talk stage than anybody else. <laughs> and yet I'm here. And the irony of this is more than a little uncomfortable. I nearly pulled out of this event. It felt irresponsible to me to come here and share some story of personal redemption while the world burns. Now, I can't see your faces obviously, but I can imagine that if these issues around de-radicalization and former's activism is new to you, you probably think this has nothing to do with you in your life. You might even think that this is just some strange outcropping of broken and damaged people who are making poor choices. I wish, I wish I could make you feel better. I wish I could tell you that was the case. But if you enjoy white privilege, this is where you get to sit in the difficulty of some really hard truths with me. When we watch the news and we see hate groups marching around or talking about population replacement or whatever conspiracy is on their mind at the time, it's easy to decide that these people are just some part of a lunatic fringe. They don't represent me. They certainly don't represent my country. This is an American problem. This isn't who and what we are. But here's the thing. Hate doesn't form in a vacuum and hate groups don't form in isolation from the world around them. In fact, I would say that they are the thin edge of the wedge, the most virulent and blatant forms of expression of a system built on white supremacy, patriarchy, genocide. They absolutely are 100% who and what we are as a country. To add to this idea of being the thin edge of the wedge, I would say that Former's activism and the problems that we're seeing there are the thin edge of a wedge of a problematic white allyship in general. Now, if you care about human rights at all, at some point you are going to end up supporting people and narratives and issues that are outside of your experience, that don't directly apply to you. And that means that you are in danger of promoting notions of healing that don't apply. It means that just like former extremists, you're in danger of breaking a whole lot of things if you're not careful. Allies, whether they're formers or otherwise, can fall into several traps. And I wish I could go through all of them, but the three I want to deal with today include selective empathy. In this case, people can be really passionate about one cause, but not understand how that cause could be impacting other people. It can also manifest in smaller ways where people do things like share images and videos of someone being victimized by the police without understanding how, that, how sharing these images can cause additional trauma to the community in question. And then, of course, there's armchair activism. This to me is really lazy, but we all do it. We all want the high reward, low effort that comes with sharing hashtags or putting a special frame around our profile picture on Facebook. It feels good. We feel like we're raising awareness. But the problem is 
we're not in fact building any kind of sustained education into the issues at hand and we're certainly not promoting the marginalized or silenced voices that are affected by these causes. And most importantly, there's a the failure to listen and learn. This is a really big one. What I see happening, and I admit I've done this myself, is I find we find ourselves in a position where we think we've done the work that we need to do. That, you know, we're, we're here, we're good, and it's other people who need to educate themselves. If we find ourselves in this kind of position, we need to take that step back, reevaluate, look for blind spots, and listen to the people who are directly impacted by the cause we're working on, and follow their lead. It can be dangerous to get caught up in the rewards of the work we're doing without remembering why we're doing it in the first place. And on top of that, especially for formers, if we fail to remember that we always have blind spots, that there's always something that we can be working on, we're in danger of letting those grow and fester and they can end up becoming a real problem. On top of all of this, I see people becoming trapped in what I call compassion fatigue. Now, in this world we're in right now with so much uncertainty, it's really hard to care about everything. It's exhausting, in fact. And it's so tempting to tell our friends and family, you know what, just stop looking at the news. Just stop reading the newspaper. Just stop. For your mental health, just stop. But the thing is, doing this is actually an expression of privilege because there are so many people who don't have the option of stepping back and tuning out. And this, in a roundabout way, brings me back to why I'm here. Why, as a former extremist, I'm here on this stage when perhaps I shouldn't be. Tuning out, turning off, turning my back, it just isn't an option. I know what hate feels like. I know what it looks like. And I know what so many people are embracing in the world today. And I just can't step away from that. Bernie Farber, my mentor and friend who helped me leave the Heritage Front 25 years ago, introduced me to the concept of tikkun olam. Now, there are many interpretations of this within Jewish literature, but I've always understood it to mean that we have a responsibility to make the world a better place than when we came into it. It isn't our responsibility to finish this work, but it's also not our privilege to set it aside either. Personally, I think this should be a universal concept. And while it can feel overwhelming and who knows where to start, fortunately, it only takes baby steps to make, an effort, to make a real impact and get somewhere. So look within yourselves. Find those blind spots and lingering prejudices. Take time to listen and learn and then act. Find a community that you can help, that you can lift up, that you can make the world a little bit better. And if you should find yourself being given a platform that you feel you don't deserve, try to do something good with it. Thank you.